We like to maintain our record of uh, always starting exactly at one o'clock, and uh, uh, I can see that we've done it again. No comments, sir. I saw you look at your watch. Okay, I'd like to call to order the City Council Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency regular meeting of Thursday, February 18, 2016. And uh, Iris, would you lead us please in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, Madam Clerk, can we have roll call, please? Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Smartrich? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Here. And Mayor Hobart? Here. <clears throat> we will now move to the first item on the agenda, which is presentations. And it uh, is my pleasure to uh, introduce you, one, one way or another, to uh, Esther Rudisil who uh, in January, on the 5th of January, to be precise, turned not 75, not 85, not 95, not 100, but 104. Is that amazing or what? <laughs> Mrs. Rudisil. <laughs> <laughs> She's got, she's got a cadre around her, and uh, they're all afraid of her. She ain't afraid of them. So I know, because I was down talking to them, and I could see that she's the boss. Uh, she was born in Altoona, Pennsylvania, if my information is correct. And in 1929, she married Ernest Rudisil, who was a drummer with the Sammy K Swing Band. I remember that, Swing and Sway with Sammy K. Remember that? Yeah, you, you remember that, don't you? Uh, they moved to Rancho Mirage in 1987 and were married for 68 years. He's recently passed. Esther has one son and one daughter, and one of her granddaughters lives next door to her and helps her out. Uh, I'd like to walk down, and I would like to first talk with Miss Rudisil, and we have a plaque to give her. And if you, need any, if you need somebody to hold your elbow as you come forward, which will surprise me if you do, but if you do, be sure you have that person. Or me. This way because that's where the camera is. That's where the camera is. So we're gonna <laughs> look I'm looking good. Oh, are you ever looking good? <laughs> I hope I look as good at 104. Wow. Think of the trouble I could cause a CV link if I lived to be 104 years old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so maybe we're gonna work on that. I'm gonna find out what the secret is. Yeah, what's but the secret? First off. How many, do you, do you what, what time do you have a little nip? What time of the day? Do I get up? No, what time do you have a little nip? Four o'clock. Four o'clock in, in the morning or afternoon? Afternoon. In the afternoon. Afternoon. And what does that little nip consist of? Scotch. Ooh, what a, what a gal. J and B. J and B scotch? J and B, only J and B. Has something to do with longevity, doesn't it? <laughs> you've, you've certainly established that. If they're not using you for commercials, they're making a big mistake. But before that, I used to drink bourbon. Did you? 
Well, what made you because switch? I came from the South. Oh, yeah. Southern people drink bourbon. But once you got to Rancho Mirage, you were no longer in the South. Is I that know, that's Scotch. You came here in 1987? I think 30 years. Yeah. Wow. We've been here about 30 years. That's fantastic. And your husband passed when? So it's good. Yeah. I was. Um, your husband was... He, he, 68 years together. 68 years. Wow. He was a that's, that's remarkable. He was, he was a drummer with Sammy K. Yeah. Swing and Sway with Sammy K. Swing and Sway with Sammy, Sammy K. K. Oh, that? do I ever remember, remember that? Remember that? Oh, do I ever. Yes. Let me read to you. Swing and Sway. Swing and Sway. Well, here, you and I can swing and sway <laughs> while I read this. This is a certificate of recognition. Thank heavens, they spent Esther right. They spelled Esther right, right. So that's cool. Everybody and Rudisil, they spelled right. That's, that's right. Okay, we got all that right. Oh, that's great. And I know that I spelled my name right, so. Did you, did you oh, yours? <laughs> we're, we're, I know, you, 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 pro you probably thought I would, they brought in an actor yeah. to uh, present this yeah. to you, but no. Thank you. They wouldn't Represent spend the money here. Yeah. Okay, let's see what this says. So you listen and I'll read. How's that? Okay. I'm gonna, you want to read it? No, I'll read it. Okay, this is presented to Esther Rudisil in honor of her 104th birthday on January 5, 2016. Mrs. Rudisil has led a long and active life, and at 104, she is still independent, enjoys walking her dog, Chi Chi, and... Is Chi Chi a rescue dog? It's a dog. Oh, good. It's a dog. Mm -hmm. And um, she loves living in Rancho Mirage. I like it. I hate to ask a personal question, but do you drive your car in Rancho Mirage? Look, I did. Past tense? <laughs> Until they took over. Oh, how so they dare they? Get in the back seat. We'll drive. Oh. That's my granddaughter. Your granddaughter is now the driver. <laughs> They're driving. A little too fast for mama, yeah, but not for grandmama, your great grandma. <laughs> okay, well, let's continue on and let's see what there is to learn. Okay, as mayor of the city of Rancho Mirage, yes. and on behalf of our entire city council, I deem it an honor and a pleasure to extend sincere congratulations. That's different, that's different from the insincere congratulations, you know. You can't put, you can't put any um, reliance on insincere, but on sincere congratulations, yeah. you can just bet the bet your bottom dollar. Okay, to extend sincere congratulations to Esther Rudisil on the recent occasion of her 104th birthday. We hereby recognize and congratulate this esteemed resident of our city for reaching this remarkable milestone and hereby extend our best wishes for many more happy years to come. That's for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My oh my. We also have roses. Oh, I love roses. You love roses? They kind of go with your hair. I love roses, yeah. And your hair is beautiful, I might say. You like my hair? And I like the quantity I of like it. Yours too. You still have some. Yeah, I still have some. Thank you. <laughs> you're right, I still have some. Like, no, no, you're a good looking man. Uh, yeah. You can't, it's too late. You've, you've already, too late? You already shot me oh, down. Too late. <laughs> already shot me down at the hair. You can't call me good looking now. <laughs> anyway, these, these roses are from our staff. It's from all the people that work here, of the council. And um, how delighted we are to find that we have such a wonderful, wonderful lady living in our city. Thank you so very much. We want to get some pictures with the family, too, so hold on a second. Do I hold the roses? Great job. Let me get the microphone behind the roses. Wait, 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 wait. So much, so much cuter with these off.
<laughs> Ready? Come on, get up here. Yeah, next to you, sweetie. Long story. When I was sick, he took care of my sick mother and her while I was in the hospital. So he was a big help to us. Sure our did, Nick. <laughs> That's your grandma <laughs> holding flowers. Oh. Essie, you should be holding flowers. Yeah, I'll hold the flowers. That's enough. I don't need to hold them. I'll hold them in front of her. Okay. Right here. Yeah, here we go. She'll Let's hold them. Amazing. We made one promise that we're not going to break. No. We're going to get her out of here so she's home by four. What a lovely family. So nice to meet all of you. Good luck in school, young man. Stay in school. Keep him in there. Okay, thank all of you. She wants, his, his she wants her roses. I think over the weekend, I think, is a certain. Oh, it is. I think it is. Mm -hmm. I have it on my calendar at home. Send me an email. I'll get right back to you. Um, it's one word G. Dana Hobart okay. at AOL. What a lady. <laughs> that, was a, that was a hoot. <laughs> Thanks for the tip. Yeah, you don't want to jump to the action. Okay, who's making the presentation on the top side? Bye. Thank you, guys. Okay. We'll take that as a threat. I mean, a promise. A promise, a promise. I meant a promise. Can we go home now? <laughs> <laughs> Hope, meal, and scotch in that order. <laughs> okay. Well, I hate to uh, return us to the mundane, but I think we're obligated to continue with our calendar, brief though it is. Um, <clears throat> We'll move now to non-agenda public comment. This is an opportunity for anybody to speak uh, on any subject that is not on today's agenda. Is there anyone who would care to speak? Seeing none, we'll go to uh, council board members, and I'd like to take the uh, honor of going first. There is a um, tremendous article in the Desert Sun of February 17th uh, is one of two that uh, Denise Goolsby has written about, as she entitles it, a true patriot, 
Tuskegee Airman of Rancho Mirage dies at age 94. Mitchell Higginbotham, a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen, the African-American pilots who graduated from Tuskegee Institute and flew as fighters and served in bomber squadrons during World War II, has died. Higginbotham, a resident of Rancho Mirage, passed away on Sunday at the age of 94. According to historical accounts, Higginbotham was one of 100 black servicemen who were arrested for attempting to enter an officers' club reserved for white officers. The event became known as the Freeman Field Mutiny. It is widely seen as a key moment in the path towards full integration of the United States Armed Services. In 2007, Higginbotham and his brother Robert Higginbotham, also a member of the elite Tuskegee Club, along with about 300 other Tuskegee Airmen, were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by President George W. Bush. Mitchell Higginbotham moved to Rancho Mirage two years ago to be closer to his brother Robert and sister-in-law Margaret. A longtime resident of Dana Point, he was active in many organizations, including the National Tuskegee Airmen, Los Angeles chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, Dana Point Historical Society, and the Tolerance Education Center of Rancho Mirage. Mitch was... Mitch was a true patriot who, against tremendous adversity and prejudice, would not waver from his allegiance to the United States and his goal to be an aviator. Palm Springs Managing Director Fred Bell said, his life and dedication should serve as an example of what one should do for their fellow men and our nation. It is one thing to espouse patriotism. It is a very different thing to strive with all your body and soul will give. And Mitch did just that. We are lucky that th these types of men stepped up to the plate during a very dark time, and I am truly blessed to have known him. A service will be held at noon on March 5 at the Tolerance Education Center, 3514 Landy Lane in Rancho Mirage. It's great to see a member of our society living at age 104. And it's a shame to see someone dying at age 94, particularly somebody like Mitchell Higginbotham. May he rest in peace, and can we have a moment of silence in his name? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Charlie? Come. Yes, I will. <clears throat> I'd just like to take a moment to thank our Sheriff's Department, law enforcement, who did an outstanding job when the President was here. Congratulations, you guys. You really, really did it. Thank you. Thanks. Ted. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the the waterfront pad is going to receive unanimous approval by the Planning Commission, the City Council, and the City Council will consider a new freestanding commercial project at the corner of Highway 111 and East Veld, directly across from the river. This is a view of the project site and from 111. The rendering that you're about to see is of the proposed project. This is depicted by the developer. It's a good indication of the strength of the Rancho Mirage market, marketplace. Uh, this has to do with the economy recovering and, frankly, what's going on uh, in the city. This is Green's International Market. 
We're excited about the progress being made at the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. As you can see, Green's International Market is working its way toward their March opening. I had heard somewhere or read somewhere that there are not enough markets in Rancho Mirage. Um, this and the recent opening of Gelson somewhat dispels that theory. The new market will bring a unique independent grocery experience to the Highway 111 corridor. The, <coughs> the next slide is another very exciting development at Rancho Las Palmas. It is the progress of a building that will be the home of the drive through Starbucks and what will be the first Pyology, which is a pizza restaurant where you pick your own ingredients and the pizza is delivered to your table within five minutes. It will be the first one in the area. So this building will is located between the new former CVS building and is expected to be a very strong draw for the city or for the center. You can get an idea of what the final product will look like through this rendering. If the completed portions uh, of the center are any indication, I'm sure this building will exceed the expectations of the center from a quality standpoint. And by the way, I was told just before the meeting today that the existing CVS building uh, began uh, the demolition project today and that will make way for Hobby Lobby, a 45,000 square foot building that will be a major contributor to the sales tax revenue of the city uh, and that began uh, today. This is the, uh, a picture uh, of what was Marie Callender's across the street and it's Bernie's Lounge and Supper Club. It was one of several new restaurants expected to be announced soon. After experiencing a devastating fire in their former Palm Springs location, Bernie's is set to occupy the former Marie Callender's building, correction on Highway 111, which is directly across the street. Bernie's is planning on significant renovations to the highly visible building with hopes to open at the beginning of the summer. And what we've seen here from the standpoint of progress in the city, the building, uh, is a tribute to our economic development department who uh, are active in assisting developers with their plans, the same with our planning department, our building department. It truly is a team effort and every one of our empty space that became empty as a result of the recession is now becoming filled. So we're very proud. The city continues to exceed expectations and uh, we look forward to a very robust 2016. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Chad. Uh, Iris? Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a few words to let everyone know that there are three events coming up at our wonderful Rancho Mirage Public Library, and they're certainly worth putting on your calendar. Uh, the first will, event will be on Monday, February 22nd, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., and it will be Maury Beschloss and Steve Kelly, and they will present their annual on-stage conversation on politics and economics. And this year's election year version is called Of Primary Importance. So Maury and Steve will agree to disagree, but in a very friendly and informative way. And the second event will be on Tuesday, February 23rd, from 2 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And it will feature Kurt Leuschner. He's a professor of etymology at the College of the Desert and will present a lecture with slides of the amazing insects of the desert. So if you're into bugs, come and get a real good education. And 
third, the third event will be on Wednesday, February 24th, for also from 2 to 3 p.m. when the and this library's Sunnylands lecture series continues with a talk by noted historian Evan Thomas on his latest book, Being Nixon, A Man Divided. So if any of those sound good to you, please put them on your calendar and please attend them. Um, but also don't forget to look online uh, under things about from our library and um, lots of great stuff coming up. And uh, we'd love to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Richard? Thank you, Dana. And I'll put my sports reporting hat on for a minute and tell you about uh, the exciting event that happened last night at uh, Rancho Mirage High School. Last night was the first round of the CIF Southern Section Division 3A basketball playoffs. Rancho Mirage entered the tournament as the number one seed because they had a 27-0 and record over the season. Last night, they played Europa Valley and came away with a 77-32 to 32 victory, oh. a lot closer than it really was. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Rancho Mirage team was far superior and played a great game. The first quarter, though, was like a 5-3 to three score, so they really poured it on the second quarter. They scored 32 points, and in the second, uh, for the third quarter, they scored 29 points. So... Uh, it was really exciting. Now Rancho Mirage moves on to the second round, which will be tomorrow night. They'll be traveling to Adelanto, uh, which is about an hour and a half to two hours away from the desert. Uh, the, uh, the scoring the, was pretty even throughout the game as far as the individual players, but Rancho Mirage has one great forward named, named Charles Neal. He scored 32 points last night, 11 in the second quarter. So uh, tomorrow night, if they win, they'll be back in Rancho Mirage probably on Wednesday for the next round of the playoffs. And if you haven't seen a high school basketball game, especially one in Rancho Mirage. You've got to take the time to go over and see it, hopefully uh, next Wednesday, and then if they go forward, uh, they will be playing Friday. If they end up going all the way to the finals, they could end up playing Palm Springs for the CIF championship. So it'll be an exciting time. Hope you can all make it. And this is the first year that the uh, school has had seniors so it's really a, a great achievement for them at this point. 28 and 0 now. Go Rattlers. Thank you, Mr. Cheerleader. Okay. We will move to um, council member, board member comments. We've just finished, I should say. We'll move now to the minutes of February 4th. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion to approve them? Second. Please vote. The motion passes unanimously. We'll move next to the consent uh, calendar. Randy, what are we going to face there? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You have three items on consent calendar today for council consideration. The first item is a fireworks display uh, request for Club Corp Charity Classic and Mission Hills Country Club. This is a request for a fireworks permit. Uh, to take place at 8 p.m. on February 27, 2016, over the 18th green of the Dinosaur Tournament course, and it will last for approximately 10 minutes. If the council approves this today, staff will uh, begin the special event permit process, which includes neighboring uh, residential notification. I think, what is that, Mike, a half a mile? Half. One mile radius of the facility will be notified. Thank you. Item number two is uh, approval of contracts. There's a couple contracts on this agenda. I just want to highlight uh, one of them. It has to do with a, um, a second year of a four-year contract with Mariposa Landscaping. This is a contract that the city administers to maintain bicycle paths and, uh, and horse trails, the Butler Abrams Trail and some uh, rural horse trails in the Clancy Lane area. Those uh, dirt trails are maintained twice per month. Is that right, Mark? Twice per month. And Dave Martin, our street maintenance supervisor, administers and oversees that contract. 
And Mr. Mayor, item number three are demands, and we are here to answer any questions. Thank Does you. anyone have any questions for them to answer? Seeing none, can we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Second. Please vote. Councilmember Townsend, could you show your vote? Ooh. Motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, reports and uh, informational items. Item number four, CV Link update. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to the subject of the CV Link? Seeing nobody, we'll close that portion. Uh, I would like to address uh, a couple of points having to do with the CV Link. Uh, for nearly a year now, we have been talking about Measure A and the use of Measure A funds. Uh, for what they were originally intended to be used for as per the ordinance that was created in 1988 and then extended again in uh, 2002. Uh, we have talked about CVAG uh, trying to use, intending to use those funds uh, to help with construction costs. They've uh, stated that they plan on taking $20 million of Measure A funds. There's a little asterisk over that. The asterisk says they sometimes deny that they have said that they were going to use uh, Measure A funds for that $20 million budget uh, entry. Uh, I absolutely guarantee you that that's what they've said and that's what got passed by the executive committee. Uh, back in 2012. Rather than talk about Measure A, I'd like to talk about a section of Measure A that has not been discussed yet. And the reason we haven't raised it is because it adds a little bit of a confusing element to the concept of Measure A. But when Measure A was passed in uh, 1988 and repassed uh, in 2002, it also created another fund. That fund was called the Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fee, TUMF, T U M F. Probably Nobody has heard anything about TUMF. I haven't seen it uh, discussed in the newspaper. I haven't seen it discussed uh, at all by any of the bulletins coming out from the friends of CV Link, and nor from any CV Link data. TUMF funds were created, as I said, back in 1988. And those funds operate like this. Anybody who comes into a city, let's say Rancho Mirage, and they plan on either building or remodeling something, one of the elements that they have to address is what will be the impact of the patrons and owners and employees of whatever is being built. It may be a home. So then it would be the family. But they have to decide in the building process, in conjunction with city pl planning department, what the impact will be on the roads and highways and transportation services of this new development. Take, for example, let's say that somebody comes in and wants to build an office building. And that, that office building is going to house a medical office and uh, a law office and this or that. What staff does in conjunction with the developers of the project is they work out from a formula that has been established, they work out the number of people that are be 
be coming in and going out and circulating all around. And who will be driving averages of how far on local highways and roadways. And they will determine that, let's again, just take a hypothetical number, but that this will add maybe one half percent of the volume of traffic on a given roadway. So by building this project, the volume of traffic on several what, several highways and roadways that will be <clears throat> within the perimeter of distance having to do with the location of the new establishment, they'll figure out approximately how many cars, what they'll weigh, the trucks, that sort of thing, and come up with a number, a financial number, that we believe that over a period of time, over a period of five years, ten years, the um, impact on the city roads will be such and such. And the developer then has to pay to the city as part of the development package a sum of money equal to the impact that they will have, that they're, the people who end up owning the property and the people who come visiting the property, all of that is taken into consideration, that they will have to pay to the city a certain, a certain amount of money. As soon as the city gets that money, they turn that money over to CVAG, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, also known as the lead agency of the CV Link. So that money gets turned over to CVAG and it goes into a transportation prioritization plan, the TIPS plan, TPPS, Transportation Prioritization Plan. What's the S stand for anyway? <clears throat> that plan is a list of about 250 roads and highways, bridges, and intersections that are in a state of disrepair. They are measured by a point system to see which are in the most serious negative condition, down to the least, but still even the least requiring uh, something, remodeling, resurfacing, who knows what. The TUMP funds also go in to that bucket of money of the Major A funds. The Major A funds go in to paying for the repairs on those 250 roads. The TUMP funds go in to the fund on paying those, the, priority, the higher priority ones get done first, obviously. Uh, but the TUMP funds go in there as well. So the makeup of the funds isn't just Measure A funds, it's also TUMP funds. Until now, not a dime. I've said this waiting to be corrected, and so far I haven't been corrected. And I'm assuming now that it's correct because I couldn't find exceptions to it. But not a dime of all the money, all the Major A funds and all the TUMP funds that have gone in to this pool of money. It's called regional Major A funds, but it includes the TUMP funds. Not a dime of it has been spent on anything other than repairing roadways bridges, uh, intersections, highways, it's always been that. About two or three years ago, there began a movement within CVAG to change these rules, not going to the voters who passed Measure A in 2002 or 1988, but doing it themselves, and it's a process that's going on right now to allow Measure A funds to be used for something other than the repair of our roadways. TUMP funds are being treated exactly the same way. They've had little or no attention in the public. But I'd like to show you evidence that what I'm saying is accurate about the TUMP funds. 
The Coachella Valley Association of Governments writes staff reports on everything under the sun within their jurisdiction. And in April 14, 2014, April 14, 2014, there was a staff report. And in that staff report, it recommended approval of the following. And one of them was update the Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fee Nexus Study. Tr Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fee, again, TUMF. Update the TUMF Nexus Study. And what that means is, I'll just use their words that are in the uh, staff report. Every five years, the TPPS, that's again the list of 250 roads that are in bad condition, the TIPS and the accompanying regional arterial cost estimate is updated. That's not part of this, the, the regional arterial cost estimate, so we'll skip that part. The last update was adopted by the Executive Committee in December 2010. So it is time to start the process for the 2015 update. I'm skipping a lot and I'm going to hit, hit a highlight now. Because the CV link will provide a major backbone facility for bikes, pedestrians, and low-speed electric vehicles, CV link as a regional project will definitely qualify for inclusion into the TIPS. And there may be other projects that will meet the criteria for inclusion. So that sentence is, only, is not talking about TUMF. It's saying that we're going to change the rules for CV Link so that instead of the criteria being dilapidated roadways or bridges or intersections, the criteria will include something else, something new that will include CV Link in some manner. In the same staff report, they say once this study is completed, the regional projects, especially CV Link and other qualifying projects, will be incorporated into the overall TPPS. An attachment. to that staff report. There's a letter dated October 3, 2014. I think that's an attachment. Let me make sure that, no, this would be a, a letter coming out later. <clears throat> it's written to um, the transportation program manager of CVAG, and it comes from a company called HD, as in David R. HDR Engineering, Inc., Thomas Kim, signs this letter. The, the subject matter is identified as following. Proposal to update the Transportation Project Prioritization Study, TIPS, Regional Arterial Cost Estimate, RACE, Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fee Nexus Study, TUMF, dot, 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 there's a little bit more. Dear Mr. Schoberg and selection panel uh, members, CVAG is poised to take a major step forward with its TUMF program. Since its adoption in 1989, the TUMF has successfully generated revenue from development impact fees to help fund many improvements to the Coachella Valley's system of regional arterials. Now the Valley's transportation needs are evolving, and the TUMF program needs to be updated to include regional ATP, Active Transportation Plan, or project. What is that? Plan? ATP. Active Transportation Plan. To include regional Active Transportation Plan projects as well as roadway improvements. To that end, this project will update the TIPS, but this is not just a routine update for these four studies. Incorporating ATP projects 
into the TUMF program requires that a nexus be established between future development impacts and the ATP infrastructure. Incorporating ATP projects into the TIPS will involve policy decisions about the allocation of TUMF revenues between roadways and ATP projects. That is saying that they are going, if CVAG's executive committee approves it, which I'm sure they will if they're asked to, uh, at least by a majority vote. It won't happen unanimously, I can guarantee you that. But if that happens, then CVAG has postured itself in a position where they can use Measure A funds and TUMP funds that originated in the Measure A legislation that was passed by the voters, that they will be using TUMP funds as well to fund a brand new project like CV Link. As I said with respect to Measure A, never has have regional Measure A dollars, that is, Measure A dollars in the kitty, so to speak, of CVAG. Never have those monies ever been used on anything other than to build repairs or replace something that is already in bad shape, uh, having to do with our roadways, intersections, and bridges. And now TUMF funds, the impact funds that the builders pay to the cities so that our roads are not overly impacted without there being enough money to repair it. Uh, that, they, that fund is also going to be subject to TUMF monies, which will reduce, just like Measure A does, if you take Measure A, it will reduce the available money to repair the roadways and the bridges and the intersections of the Coachella Valley where that money was intended to be spent in the first place. And I assume that everybody's been reading the same stuff I've been reading. We've got the bullet train is under serious uh, jeopardy now because it's going way beyond the projected costs, uh, the money going into that. Uh, we've had funds taken back from CVAG. CVAG claims to have raised 75 million. The state just took back 2 million of it because of the need to spend the money on the roadways of California. Riverside County is 14th highest in need for uh, money to repair debilitated roadways, according to material I've read in the newspapers, and you have as well. The state is taking back that money, but we are saying, CVAG, in our name, is saying they're going to use that money to repair roadways and bridges and intersections or replace them. They're going to do that instead of using that money for, they're going, to, they're going to not repair those roads, but rather they're going to use that money in order to build a brand new bicycle path and neighborhood electric vehicle path. Interestingly, the neighborhood electric vehicles, that's the excuse that is being used by CVAG to claim an entitlement to certain um, uh, monies that have been made available through grants from one source or another of which so far I don't, I don't think any more than one grant has really fallen into that category for CVAG, maybe two. But that money is going to be gone, and uh, CVAG is going to use that money for a brand new project. Now I noticed, I noticed one of the measures that we have on the ballot is Measure 4. And Measure 4 talks in terms of whether we should vote yes or no about using Measure A funds uh, to um, pay for CV Link. In the argument, and Measure A funds, keep in mind now, are in the same category as TUMP funds. They're almost identical. They were created by the same legislation back in the 90s. One of the quotes that Measure 4 opponents, or no, op proponents, because we're against it, that counts, at least I am, uh, 
they say this, the council's argument for this ballot measure is full of inaccuracies. For example, the council states that Measure A funding has never, quote, has never before been spent on an utterly brand new project, end quote. Do they forget that our elected officials spent Measure A funding on an utterly brand new pr bridge to make sure we could travel safely along Dinosaur Drive? Yeah, a bridge. That's what the money's supposed to be spent for. Highways, bridges, intersections, roadways, like, you know, the smaller streets out here. So to say that we have misstated something and to say that uh, a bridge is brand new, yes. That's what Measure A funds are to be spent for. The Jefferson Street overpass, the, uh, the off-ramp off the freeway. That's also brand new. But before that, there was an inadequate situation with the existing uh, off-ramp. So it's brand new, but it has to do with travel transportation. So the argument is a bit disingenuous. The sad thing is... I don't think that even the building industry has been made fully aware of the intention of CVAG to use TUMF funds to be part of the pot into which the CV link dips itself. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about it today was so that people who watch this program uh, will be aware the TUMP funds are part of this, the grab of public funds that were never intended to be used for something like this. And one last thing, I mentioned how many, I mentioned that uh, it is the existence of neighborhood electric vehicles, also known as low-speed electric vehicles. They're one and the same under both state and federal law. We are spending millions to build a pathway, to have on CV Link, to have these neighborhood electric vehicles allowed, they have to meet certain state and federal standards. Seven foot width in each direction is required. So we're building 14 feet of this special roadway, it has to comport to uh, state standards as well, so that the electric vehicles can ride on it. Do you know how many neighborhood, <coughs> excuse me, do you have any idea, any guess as to how many neighborhood electric vehicles there are registered in the Coachella Valley? The answer comes from the Department of Transportation, who, because NEVs, LSEVs, have to be registered with the state. So we're doing all of this building, spending all of these millions of dollars or how many of those vehicles? 287 in the whole valley, according to the DMV. We have the report from the DMV. 36 in Rancho Mirage. And we're spending all that money and going to all this effort so that we can get our hands on Measure A funds so CVAG can get their hands on Measure A funds. We're doing that under the guise of benefiting somebody. They make it sound, CVAG makes it sound like golf carts are going to be permitted on the roadways. Golf carts will not be permitted except on the part of the CV link that is on ordinary roadways that are in existence right now. They'll be specially marked. They would have to be specially marked for uh, to allow it in some instances. But all of that money being spent for 286 vehicles and no uprising from the people because nobody knows about this stuff. The newspaper has printed some stories on it, not on this point, the Tump point, but it's not enough. It can't be just some fluff stories. Uh, it's got to... The stories of the newspapers, the stories of the television stations, and the stories coming from us, they've got to show the economic impact of what we are in the process of doing. Spending $100 million on a glorified bike path? Anyway, that's my report for 
this episode. Thank you. So, anybody else like to speak to this subject? Okay. We'll move on then to action items. Item number five, having to do with our mid-year budget adjustments. I suspect that's going right over to Isaiah Hagerman. Certainly is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The uh, item before you today is our mid-year budget adjustment review and the result of that review. So each year, halfway through the year, the city manager will lead a review of our budget to actual halfway through the year. And we will propose any budget adjustments to the city council for consideration. The city manager and I uh, met and reviewed each adjustment listed in the staff report in detail with the budget subcommittee, which consists of Mayor Hobart and Councilman Kite. On page one of the staff report, we give the overall summary of our general fund. So at the beginning of the year, uh, the original budget uh, is on the left-hand column. The results of the mid-year budget adjustment requests that you're seeing today are the middle column, and the end result, if these adjustments are approved today by the city council, is the far right column. So going down to the bottom, uh, you can see that at the beginning of the year, we were projecting an operating surplus of just under 1.2 million. As a result of the mid-year adjustments we're requesting, we are decreasing our revenues by 245,000, and we are increasing our operating expenditures by 389,760, leaving an end result of an operating surplus of 561,897. The operating revenues, uh, the adjustments that make up the uh, total decrease of 245 are listed on page 5-2 of the staff report. And uh, we have two adjustments to some uh, plan check fees and some inspection fees just based on current activity. We felt like an, adju an adjustment down was warranted uh, based on six months of activity. The bottom one, the largest one, uh, the decrease of 185,000 uh, in lease back revenue. This is really just a timing difference. So we didn't actually lose this revenue. It's just there's a timing difference between when we were projecting on uh, purchasing the Ritzwa Suites units and when we will actually purchase them. So this was a full year of lease back revenue in our budget. Uh, we're now dropping that down to one month. So it's just a timing issue. For the remainder of the revenue, uh, you know, about 50% of the general fund revenue comes from TOT and bed, uh, sales tax. And at this point, we have not gone through our peak season, so we did review those estimates. Uh, however, because we haven't experienced our peak season where we get a lot of our revenue, we didn't feel like at this time we had enough data to recommend any adjustments. We did feel like we were on target with those estimates. Page 5-3 of the staff report summarizes the general fund expenditures, uh, the adjustments that we're requesting here. And so up at the top in the general fund, we budget by three categories, salaries and benefits, operations and maintenance, and department capital. So in the first category, salaries and benefits, we are decreasing the salaries and benefits budget by $169,458. And the detail of this is shown on page 5-4 of the staff report. But in summary, the, the reason for the decrease is, again, timing differences. So in our budget, we had some open positions that we went ahead and budgeted for a full year. When we actually filled those positions, they were not there for a full year. So these are timing differences that we're seeing. In the operations and maintenance category, uh, in the IT division, uh, there is an increase in temp staff of 35,000, and that was because we had some vacant IT positions that we didn't fill right at the beginning of the year, part of what led to the decrease that we saw above. So this is truing up that temp since they were here longer than what we had, ha had anticipated. Uh, code compliance uh, has seen an increase in its abatement activity. So we are requesting an increase of 20,000 for our abatement activity. And uh, as the council is aware, in June, uh, we do uh, levy tax rolls for any of the abatement that we have not received back. And so this does come back to the city. So as we see an increase in the activity, there is also a corresponding reimbursement via the lien process. It's just, again, a timing difference between when those two things happen. We incur the expense first, lien the rolls, and get paid later. 
the largest adjustment that uh, we're seeing here is in public safety. So public safety, uh, specifically our sheriff costs, we're proposing a $365,000 increase. And that was based on the activity that we've seen so far this year. And essentially this is uh, something that every agency that is contracting with the County for Sheriff Services has seen. Uh, this is to true up this year's estimate uh, based on the increases that we've seen through the first six months of the year. The uh, next item is a $50,000 increase in uh, a sick leave buyback. Uh, this was a, a one-time buyback as part of the MOU. Uh, the last uh, one in operations and maintenance it was an increase to the turf conversion rebate program. Uh, so in September uh, 2015, the council approved an increase in that budget. We're just uh, showing it here now for you today. And the last one is in department capital, very last one on the page. Uh, we replaced a uh, cop's vehicle, and that is not our sheriffs. This is citizens on patrol. Uh, so they received a new vehicle, and that was approved in April of 2015. However, due to the timing of the purchase, we uh, purchased it in the current fiscal year. So that's why you're seeing the adjustment now. At a high level, uh, this chart on the screen shows us uh, how we're utilizing some of our reserves for some of the significant projects that we have going on in the city. Uh, so I'll focus on the two red boxes. So uh, we're spending about 10.5 million. Where is that coming from? That's what the chart below shows us. So we have designated our reserves into certain categories, and this will show you the use of those reserves in the middle column. So again, uh, the Section 19 Water Reserve, we are anticipating funding that. That's $5 million. The Ritz Spa Suites purchase, that is also $5 million. We're doing some capital improvements, capital projects. That's a little over a million dollars. And so at the end of the day, we're using $10.5 million of our reserves. We're estimating as of the end of this fiscal year, we will be just under $56 million in reserves. And that's the general fund. So now we're gonna leave the general fund and go over into our restricted funds, or special revenue funds. And really, uh, the, the list is on you. This is on, uh, on the screen for you. The list is on page 5-5. Uh, with our special revenue funds, it's a restricted resource, and so we can only spend that restricted resource on certain items. Uh, so typically these adjustments are fairly common. Uh, the one that I did want to highlight for the council today is the very bottom one in the red box. And this is out of our air pollution mitigation fund. Uh, we are purchasing, um, a broom is a little deceiving. It's actually a whole vehicle and it's for the purpose of uh, cleaning up blow sand. And I'm going to turn this over to our public works director, Mark Sambito, to give you a little bit more information about it. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, the purpose of the request to purchase this vehicle, which is really, it's a vehicle with a mechanical broom. It looks like a street sweeper broom. The difference between it and a street sweeper is a street sweeper includes a vacuum. This does not. But the request for this is so that we can, in public works, better serve the public and be more responsive to our blow sand situations. We obviously have a season coming up where that's a real problem on a lot of our northern roadways, and we want to be as responsive as we can and ensure a safe travel way that doesn't have a lot of sand on it. Uh, Mark, can you uh, explain to us the, what this does specifically as compared to what the street sweepers do specifically? Uh, certainly. The, uh, can we put the vehicle back up on the screen, please? Right. What you'll see here is the, the blue brushes actually turn and will sweep up the, the, the sand. It will create a situation where we can more easily either flip the sand over the top of the curb back onto the, the property with and out of the roadway. Or, or with other equipment? No, using this equipment using, alone. Okay. Using this equipment alone. Or if we have a real bad situation, we can create rows of material so that we can follow it with our loader and just scoop it up. But we can much more effectively get it off of the road. Currently, we're using shovels and a, you know, a, and a, a loader trying to scoop it up manually. A street sweeper will put down water, 
it will brush the stuff out of the gutter into the roadway and then vacuum it up. Then that vacuum tank needs to be emptied and maintained. So this is significantly different. This piece of equipment, we're asking for approximately $55,000. A street sweeper is about a quarter of a million dollars. So they're significantly different animals. Though what we like about this is we're able to control the dust, address our PM10 issues. Uh, it's very minimal maintenance, and yet it's sizable enough that we will be able to get it out there ourselves on a regular basis. And we should be able to even utilize this on our Butler Abrams Trail and some of our other trails as well. So we think that what we're doing is we're providing a much higher uh, response to maintenance of our streets and our trails. Thank you. Anything else from you on this, uh, Isaiah? Uh, no, just uh, wanted to thank the budget. Sorry about that. I just wanted to thank the budget subcommittee uh, for your insight and direction during this process. And uh, I think what you know what we typically see when uh, we get to final results with actuals is there's always a bit of a difference between what we're budgeting and what we see in actual the surplus tends to about double when we look at actual results and that's due to the conservative nature in our budget where most expenditures uh, will end a little under their budgeted amount and most revenues will come in a little bit above their budgeted amount. So the movement there, uh, we typically see uh, when we look at actuals that the surplus is about double what we projected in our budget. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions of staff? I do. Yeah, Richard? No, thank you, Dana, and thank you, Isaiah. You did a great job on, on the report. Could you address page 512 for everybody? I think it's, it would be important for everybody to understand where our reserve funds are now. Absolutely. <clears throat> So uh, page 512 of the staff report, which is the, the exact table that's up on the screen right now, uh, really shows at a high level for the general fund, at the end of the day, um, what is happening with the general fund and where our spending is happening. So with anything, uh, if you saw that you had deficits up in your operating area, you would be concerned because you would have a structural problem. You don't want to see deficits there. Uh, where our deficits are are down in the non-operating side. So these are generally one-time costs. And so we have created different reserve balances to show uh, how this spending is taking place and what bucket it's coming out of. And so uh, just briefly, at about $10.5 million, uh, we are spending about $10.5 million this year. And you'll see that most of that is wrapped up into really two major purchases. We've got the purchase of the Ritz Spa Suites for $5 million, and then the Section 19 water development to bring water into that section. Our uh, component of that is also $5 million. Now, the important thing to note about both those items is eventually we will see that money return to the general fund. Uh, via the agreements that are in place. But for right now, we're accounting for the uh, expenditure of the funds. And so our spending is in each of these categories. And what you'll see at the very top in the unassigned fund balance is that is actually growing, which means we were spending money out of these categories. And then the money that wasn't designated to a specific category actually is growing. I do Thank have you. a question. Yeah, just go ahead, Charlie. On five three, section two, operation and maintenance, public safety increase expenses for public safety services. Can anybody explain that and what that was for, or how it came about? Does it have to do with the homeless or what? Uh, no, this this is really, I think, just part of, of what we're seeing as a whole with the increases that are coming out of the sheriff's office. Um, you know, in recent years, we've been getting increases somewhere between 7 to 8% in these sheriff costs. And when we looked at the, the numbers this year, um, we felt like, 
you know, we were a little behind based on what we were seeing. Uh, they give you ranges when we put together our budget. And uh, so this adjustment, it, you know, you can't pin it on any one thing. It's not one event. It's just the increase that we're seeing in public safety. All right, so there's no additional programs that was added to this is strictly salary or expenses to maintain yeah so level of service is staying consistent this is just the annual increase that, that we're seeing as a part of this okay thank you any other questions just one brief question sure. uh, when the cops vehicle was replaced whatever happened to the decommissioned vehicle were we able to sell it or donate it if I may uh, the uh, we are evaluating all of the surplus or um, unused vehicles at the moment, and we are going to come to you with a list of vehicles and recommendations on how we might either donate surplus or <clears throat> recycle them. So we'll have that for you probably in a month's time. Thank you. I have one question on uh, page 5-3. We've apparently bought a new uh, COPS vehicle. I remember a few years ago, raising the subject of whether uh, we could uh, paint the cop's vehicle to look more like a, a police vehicle, a county sheriff vehicle, uh, on the theory, at least my theory, uh, that if you see that kind of a vehicle in your mirror or coming toward you, uh, you're more apt to slow down and meet the speed limit requirements than uh, you would be if you saw the white cops vehicle and I'm wondering if anybody's looked in to that has there been is that just something that has floated with the breeze or what huh you uh, okay Steve Q has got some thoughts oh, no, no. Oh. oh he'll look into it yeah Mark uh, I, I was gonna say the same is that I, I will look into it um, with our partners over at the sheriff's department I'm I suspect that uh, Steve will uh, also find that there's probably some regulations in the ability to mimic a law enforcement vehicle when you are not an actual law enforcement person. Yeah, because they, they have really strict um, rules regarding badges now. Very strict about rules. What? Regarding badges. What? Badges. Badges. Uh, so well, the badges imagine, we don't have to uh, worry about. But. Yeah, but I imagine they probably have the same kind of rules. Anyway, in place. I, I would like to see, and I suppose everybody would be little, somewhat interested in seeing. Uh, how how far we can go in that direction, if at all? Great. Yeah, we do a little bit right now. They they do get uh, city emblems on the side of their vehicle, and there is a light bar on the vehicle. Uh, but uh, we'll wait for Steve's review to see if we can do anything okay. further. Any any time I see a vehicle that's black on the bottom, white on the top, I slow down. <laughs> see, I don't have to, so it's <laughs> because I'm already under the speed limit. Somebody's usually honking at me. Uh, anyway, I, I'm not asking for your comments. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any. You don't have the floor. Okay, I'm, uh, Charlie, Charlie, you don't have the floor. And neither does anybody else. Okay. Uh, does anybody in the audience like to discuss this subject, at least in a very temperate manner? Okay, seeing none, we'll close that subject. Can we have a motion on the... Uh, the um, I'd like to move the City Council approve the attached resolution number 2016, next in order, approving and adopting the fiscal year 2015-2016 mid-year budget adjustments. Please vote. How <laughs> dare you try to blackmail me. The, vote, the, the motion carries unanimously. We'll now move to the last item on today's agenda, where Randy and Isaiah Hagerman will be uh, discussing the uh, annual review of statement of investment policy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be professionally handing that off to Isaiah to discuss. Coward. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Binder, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, each year, the Budget Subcommittee reviews our investment policy. The investment policy is uh, the procedures and um, outlines what investments we can and cannot invest city funds in. So this is the governing policy over all city funds. 
The annual review this year uh, consisted of uh, reviewing government code, and there were no updates to government code that required us to change our policy. Uh, the other area of review that we considered was the possibility of adding additional investment options into our policy. Currently, we uh, allow treasuries and agencies and LAIF for liquidity. And so we were looking at various options in the context of this review as we do annually. And, and really what, uh, what we decided was, uh, yes, you know, by adding additional options, you could add additional yield. However, we felt the risk that we would have to bring into the portfolio uh, was something that we did not want to do at this point. And really, we considered the current uncertainty in market conditions, and really in our policy, you know, the highest priority that we have is the protection of government funds over additional yield. And so what we're recommending is no changes to the policy at this point. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Isaiah. Is, are there any questions of Isaiah? Dana, just a brief comment. Uh, I think you, uh, da the mayor and I both agreed that what, uh, what Isaiah recently said about uh, making it sure that we don't take risk. And, and we decided that uh, this year, given some of the uncertainties, that we would be on the safe side. But we will review this policy every year to not only see if, what the advantages may be on existing investments, but also if there are any new investments currently available. This is very conservatively invested, and we want to make sure it stays that way, at least over the near term. Good. One additional comment I'd make is every now and then, at least two or three times a year, somebody asks me or makes a comment to me that um, uh, you could earn more money on city reserves uh, in, in, a, in a variety of ways, and they always have a variety of ways. It is true, you could. Uh, but you also take more risk. And those people uh, don't have the obligation that uh, the council members have. We have a fiduciary relationship with the residents of our city. And because of that relationship, preserving our reserves is the highest priority because people don't expect to lose money, uh, of money that's being saved in their name. And consequently, uh, uh, Richard and I both uh, are firmly believe that the uh, it's safer to give up a few basic basis points in uh, in interest uh, for the assurance of genuine safety and we do live in times that are portending of some degree of future economic difficulty so i just wanted to add that to the uh, pot is there anybody in the audience who would like to discuss this subject? Seeing none, we'll close that. Um, can we have a motion, please, to, a, to approve the investment policy? I will make that motion that the City Council approve the attached resolution number 2016, next in order, adopting the City's statement of investment policy. Second. Moved and seconded. Please vote. Oh, just the motion carries. I was going to ask to hold it back. I do have a really hot tip at Santa Anita tomorrow, and I think we could make some money with our money. I guess it's too late. Okay. Too late. <laughs> Darn. You'll regret it when I tell you how much that horse paid. Okay, uh, that ends the uh, regular session, and we'll now turn to our city attorney, Steve Quintanilla, to tell us what awaits us in closed session. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City Council at this point is going to recess into closed session um, regarding three potential initiation of litigation items pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9. And the Council will also confer with the City Attorney regarding existing litigation pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9. And the name of that case is Veronica Juarez versus City of Ranch Mirage. Where was that? We stand in recess.